بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين May the peace and the blessings of the Lord be with you my friends السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In this series we're going to discuss the tafsir and the explanation elucidation or the exegesis of an important chapter in the Holy Quran. That chapter is chapter 49, Surah Al-Hujurat, the chambers, or the some people call it the private apartments. And it is dubbed as the surah, the chapter of akhlaq and adab, mannerism and good character and good qualities because this chapter though short it has only 18 verses but it is filled with the beautiful instructions to the Muslim community the early Muslim community which was in Medina this chapter is one of the uh, early Medinian chapters in the Quran it's filled with advice, instructions, and commandments to this community as to how to treat the Prophet himself in the beginning. Because verses from 1 to 5 instructs the members of the Muslim society uh, of proper conduct, proper etiquette, with the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then from 6 to 12, speaks about the principles of conduct with community members, with each other. How do you deal with each other? How do you treat each other? How do you speak to each other? How do you think about each other? And so you can avoid conflict. You can avoid suspicion and misunderstanding. And then verses from 13 to 18 clarifies the true nature of faith. What is faith? Is faith just saying that I'm a Muslim? Or is faith is only conducting prayers and fasting? Or it is something else beyond prayers, beyond fasting? So it outlines the true nature of faith. Why this chapter is important, my friends? Because the core of faith is not just the prayers and fasting. Prayers and fasting are a prelude, an introduction, an impetus to the faith, to know the faith, to get introduced to it. But the core of faith is your relationship with yourself, with your Lord, with your brothers and sisters, with your neighbors, with your friends. This is the core of faith. The core of faith is to be someone who is cherished in the society. Someone who is respected and honored in the society. To earn the respect of those who are around you. The admiration of those who are around you. So when your name is mentioned, most of the people who hear about you, they say he's a good person. He has a good influence. I have good experience with him or her. I have a good encounter with him. I have a good story about him to tell. Not only you impact people's life, but you impact your own life too. You feel relieved. You feel happy. When you have no problem with others, when there is no hate, no jealousy, no rivalry, no competition with others. When you think of others as being your family members, as being your brothers and sisters, as being equal to you. When you look at them with compassion, with thoughtfulness, with consideration, with mercy, with respect, you enjoy this life. 
What brings happiness or sadness into this life? Are these things happening by accident? Are these things happening, you know, uh, because God wants some people to be happy, whereas others should be always sad and distressed? No, it's not like that. God wants all the people to be happy. God intends goodness and happiness for all of us. But it, it, but it is us, us, we the people. We the people who decide and determine happiness or sadness for ourselves. Through what we say, through what we do, through our behaviors. So this surah is called, this chapter is called Surah Al-Akhlaqi Wal-Adab, the good character and good mannerism and the distinctive quality of behavior. The Quran is replete with such instructions. In one of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ In chapter 2, verse 83, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا Before he speaks about fasting and about the prayers and about charity, he says, say goodness to people. Be nice to them. Be respectful. قُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا This is the core of religion. Some people, they uh, practice fasting and prayers. But unfortunately, they are not moving forward. They are not changing themselves. They are not changing their behavior. They are not treating each other with kindness, with courtesy, with thoughtfulness. And these prayers and these fastings are doing nothing to them. They did not pay attention to the spirit of fastings and prayers. To the reason of fasting and prayers. Why God wants me to pray? They only think that God wants them to pray, but they don't ask the question why. Why God wants me to fast? What is the end result of fasting? Is it only deprivation from food and drink? Or it is something much bigger than that? Some people, they uphold the ritualistic side of religion, the physical side of religion, not the moral, neither the spiritual. This is why they gain nothing. They come back from the prayers empty-handed. They come back from fasting the whole month of Ramadan empty-handed. It's the same old story, quarreling with each other, being suspicious, attacking each other, backbiting each other, putting down each other, betraying each other. So what's the point of fasting 30 days? What did you do? You wasted your time. You wasted your effort. Sometimes, you see this happening even in the grand mosques of Islam, in the first and second mosques in Islam. At the time of the prayer, sometimes you find some people, they, they, they fight over who should stand here, who should occupy this space. They shove each other, they push each other. Sometimes they insult each other. Sometimes while people are circumambulating around the house of God, performing the tawaf, but they don't pay attention to the spirit of the tawaf, to the manners of tawaf. They become less tolerant with each other. They physically sometimes abuse each other while they are doing something very sacred, and very instrumental in their life. And for many of them, this is the, their first and last time. They don't go to Mecca every day. This is their first opportunity and last opportunity. But they don't pay attention, unfortunately. Maybe sometimes they insult each other. Maybe sometimes they are involved in acts of incivility. 
discourteousness, impoliteness. Islam says before you perform your tawaf and your prayers and your fasting, you have to be a civil person. You have to be civilized. You have to be thoughtful. You have to be considerate. You have to be accommodating to your brothers and sisters. You have to be forgiving. You have to be tolerant. Even when we worship God, it should not be at the expense of others, my friends. I'll give you a few examples from Muslim societies. Raising the adhan before the prayers, whether you pray in the mosque or the house, it's desirable, mustahab, something good, to announce the adhan, to declare it publicly. But that adhan should not be at the expense of others, especially if the adhan is in the early morning, the fajr, which is about an hour and 20 minutes before sunrise especially when you live in a neighborhood where your neighbors are, let's say, non-Muslims, or many of them are elderly, some of them are sick, some of them are infants and children. Here, one cannot argue that the adhan is mustahab, desirable, so I'm going to raise my voice no matter what happens. We have to be considerate, my friends, here. Our adhan, which is not even mandatory, it is only mustahab recommended, should not be at the expense of hurting others. Here we have to weigh the situation. Which one is more important? Raising the adhan or respecting the rights of our neighbors, especially when they have some elderly people or some sick people who need to rest who should not be disturbed. Which one is more important? Here, we use the brain. What does the brain say? What does reason say? These are very small issues, but it has a huge impact. I remember someone who converted to Islam. He's a convert. He told me when I was non-Muslim, I hated Islam. And the reason I hated Islam, because I saw nothing but negative things. One of them, he was telling me, he lives in an, uh, in an Arab country where there are mixed communities, Muslims and Christians, in that country. So he said in our neighborhood there was a mosque and they would ra raise the adhan several times a day. And sometimes, in certain occasions, they had, you know, some chantings, some recitations, some supplications, and others. They will do some readings from a huge loudspeakers outside. And my apartment, it was so close to the mosque. Actually, it overlooked the mosque. So all that sound would come into my apartment and I get irritated. I lose sometimes my patience. I start cursing because of this voice. But he says, through a friend of mine, I started reading about Islam. I read the Quran. That a friend was telling me about the true nature of Islam. So one day I complained to him. I said, but why do you harass your neighbors? He said, this is unnecessary. And even the Prophet would not do that. If the Prophet knows that there are non-Muslims in this area, probably 50%, it could be 60%, it could be 40%, doesn't matter. And this adhan, this voice, whether it is adhan or something else, it would harass them, it will compromise their, their rest. He would stop that. 
He will say, let's do the Adhan inside, not outside. Inside the mosque. So we respect our neighbor's rights. So I was surprised. I said, is this, you think, what the Prophet is going to say? He said, yes, I'm sure. Because the Prophet, in many occasions, he spoke highly about the neighbors and how we should respect their rights. Not an encroach upon their rights and dignity. I said then, this is a good religion. He said, of course, Islam is a good religion. The principles of Islam are good, but sometimes the applications are wrong. People do not know how to apply these good principles in a good manner, in a good fashion. People do not know how to present Islam in a nice way to others. He says, I started my journey into learning more and more and studying. And here you are. I'm a Muslim. I'm a proud of this religion. So my friends, again, there are certain things that might be small. Now, sometimes if the, if the Adhan is a majority Muslim country, the neighborhood, let's say 90%, 99% of them are Muslims, and they'd love to hear the Adhan outside to be notified and go to the mosque. It's okay, perfectly okay. But if your Adhan is an area where the majorities are non-Muslims, and really it causes some disturbance, then you don't have to do that, my friend. You may do that within your own circle, within your own home, within your own mosque, but inside, not outside. The Adhan is the call for the prayers for those who pray, not for those who do not pray, not for those who do not believe in the prayers. Through coercion, imposing our tradition on others, we are not going to gain any ground. Actually, we are going to lose. We have to learn the manners, the adab. Islam did not say just fasting and the prayers. He said, even when he speaks about prayers, what does he say? Oh, people, sallu, pray? No, he says, aqimu salat Aqimu, the verb aqimu, to establish, it has many connotations. One of them is that to establish the principles, the beauty of the prayers, the goals of the prayers, the spirit of the prayers, the result of the prayers. And what is the result of the prayers? It forbids from shameful acts, embarrassing acts, shameful acts, and from any evil. And the evil could be hurting your neighbor, could be an evil, evil act. Or not being considerate towards him. It could be considered an evil act. This is the spirit of the prayers. The spirit of the prayer says, when we go to the mosque, I can accommodate the, the person who would stand next to me, on my right, on my left, behind me. I respect him. I don't bother him. This is the spirit of the prayers. The spirit of the prayers, we pray together. It means we love each other. Not that we are rival with each other. We hate each other. This is not the spirit of the prayers. This goes against the spirit of the prayers. Same thing with reciting dua. Same thing with reciting Quran. When I recite Quran, I should not bother others. When I recite my dua, I should consider others who are sitting next to me. If I am in a mosque, when I recite Quran, I should consider that I share this land, this ground, this space with many others. Some of them want to be silent. Some of them want to meditate. Some of them want to reflect. Some of them want to pray. So I have to consider them. In some of the holy shrines of our imams, some people enter the shrine and they yell and scream with the loudest of their voices, salawat or something else. 
They disturb sometimes. They disturb, I'm telling you. They disturb someone who's reading the ziyara and he's trying to focus on the ziyara, on the meaning of the ziyara. Ziyara is not only a few sentences, I say them and I don't understand them. In each sentence of the ziyara, in each verse, in each word of the ziyara, there is a meaning, there is a deep meaning. So if I read the ziyara, I have to focus on it. And if someone wants to disturb me, I would lose my focus. I would lose my concentration. I would be irritated. I would not enjoy my ziyara. So we have to be respectful to each other. Even when we send salawat, be respectful. Say it at the time which is needed, not at any time. Not at any time. Don't use the, don't cheapen the salawat. Don't cheapen it. Say it when it is needed. Sometimes we use it to, 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 to quiet people, to tell them be quiet. This is not the right place. Salawat is to praise the Prophet and his family. It has to be said when it is due, when it is necessary. Not out of that space and out of that context. These are the manners that we have to learn. Small things, but they make a huge impact. And this chapter 49 is an important chapter that teaches us how to deal with others. First, how to deal with the Prophet and second, how to deal with each other. And we will spend, inshallah, a quality time reflecting on this chapter. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.